Next, we have Patrick Wood, who spoke at our propaganda conference also. Patrick Wood um, has a um, Citizens for Free Speech organization, incredibly powerful, and one of his icons in this is Sophie Scholl, who's long been one of my icons, German girl who was executed for distributing anti-Hitlerian facts on, in pamphlets. Um, he's long been speaking out against propaganda. He's a leading and critical expert on various globalist agendas, such as sustainable development, Agenda 21, 2030, Agenda and Historic Technocracy. He's also the editor-in-chief of Technocracy.News, an amazing, super informative, and up-to-the-minute up to reporting of things related to, the, to current events, in particular totalitarian power grabs. Please join me in welcoming, there he is, Patrick Wood. And I have to always pull the microphone up. I don't know why occasionally. I have spoken in churches uh, around the West, and for some reason, all the pastors are short. <laughs> and it's almost embarrassing, you know, short podiums and the microphone is like way down, but I'm a big guy, so that's the way it is. And uh, <clears throat> you'd also see a big guy if Jacob Nordengard were here in person, because he's a big guy too. But uh, he'll be coming in by, by remote. He couldn't get out of Europe. Actually, he could get out of Europe, he couldn't get in the United States. So my topic today is gonna be very narrow. Um, I'd love to talk about all these other things, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to talk about genetic takeover, in particular of all the DNA on Earth. Uh, you all know what DNA is? Everybody you okay with that? Do I need to define it? That's what makes your body work, right? That, you know, your DNA. Everybody's different, but that's why you're different. And um, we're going to talk about humans as well. So I am Patrick Wood. I'm the editor of uh, Technocracy News and Trends. These are my, some of my books. From the past and um, current book, um, The Evil Twins of Technocracy and Transhumanism, is being serialized right now on Substack, patrickwood.substack.com. If you'd like to get an early peek at the book, you can go there and subscribe for a small amount. It helps me to pay the expenses to get the book out. But I started writing about globalization back in the 1980s, uh, actually 1970s, with uh, Professor Anthony Sutton. Uh, most of you have heard me before and know that, and I've talked about it. And uh, for some reason, somehow, I ended up being the, um, the last living <laughs> eyewitness <laughs> of those early, tech, uh, those early trilateral commission days. And uh, we produced two books, two volumes of trilaterals over Washington back then. And um, I'm not going to talk about that much today at all. But uh, I discovered historic technocracy many, many years ago, actually 15 so years ago and uh, integrated it into my knowledge of the Trilateral Commission, globalization, and so on, that, that made a big sea change in the early 1970s. And I'm not going to talk much about that either, but I just want to lay the groundwork for it. And uh, here we go, Time Magazine. I'm going to bring up a lot of uh, covers of Time Magazine as we go along here. Um, <clears throat> this one uh, is about the Great Reset. Imagine that. This is a makeover of the world. There's uh, scaffolding is uh, raised up there and all the different people doing different things, including opening up the world, and uh, who knows what they're doing inside. But uh, this, was, uh, this was the telltale that something big was going on. And I'm going to talk about the topic of transhumanism. This is, a, as I said, a narrow subset. You'll see how it fits in in a minute. But we need to, we need to address this, this topic separately. Um, this uh, definition was given by the founder of modern transhumanism, by the name of Max Moore. He is a PhD in philosophy, by the way, but he also uh, has been a, a pillar in the community. He's kind of a founding father of, uh, I guess, of modern transhumanism. He wrote this back in the early 1990s. He said, Trans transhumanism promotes an interdisciplinary approach, uh, we'll see in a minute, NBIC, what that means, to understanding and evaluating the opportunities for enhancing the human condition and the human organism opened up by the advancement of technology. Attention is given to both present technologies like genetic engineering and information technology and anticipated future ones such as molecular nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. Don't, don't, lose, don't let me lose you here, okay? These are big terms. Maybe they have some philosophical content behind them, I'm not sure, but they're big terms and you'll see some of what I'm talking about, what, what these mean. We talk about the convergence and this is important. 
Um, <clears throat> and since I only have about 40 minutes to deliver this, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. A uh, picture is worth a thousand words, so I figure I'm going to accelerate my, my talk by about 5,000 words here. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> uh, the convergence. NBIC. You'll see this bantered around. What it stands for is uh, in the inner circle, the acronym NBIC, nanotechnology on the upper left, biotechnology in the upper right, uh, information technology and cognitive technology. That's, um, and of course, the, the lighter green around the outside gives you an idea, a clue what those uh, refer to. These used to be all separate physical disciplines at university, you realize, every one of them. You had neuroscience department, you had an information technology department, you had a, uh, you know, uh, the nanotechnology or physical sciences department. But starting about 19, about, well, late 1990s, around 2000, these different departments began to merge together, not totally, but they began to contribute people from those departments to create this new convergent science department where people from each of these individual disciplines came over and started talking to each other and working out ways that they could enhance the human condition. This has become a worldwide phenomenon, and it happened in academia before anybody paid any attention to it. Nobody knew really what was going on. I mean, who goes and gets a story? If you're a journalist, who goes to get a story at some university laboratory? It just doesn't happen. It's got to be the most boring place on the planet as far as, you know, shock value is concerned well, until now. So when they talk about convergence, they're talking about taking all four of these together and applying this new science, this NBIC science, to the condition of man, to advance the condition of man. I'm talking about your humanity, your, your physical body in particular here. And you can imagine every major university in the world now has a convergence department or NBIC department. Every single one of them, they're all funded uh, by and large uh, to some extent with taxpayer money. You've already seen that theme twice already, both speakers. It's not surprising, I suppose, you know, if, if you don't have your own money to pay for something, get the taxpayers to pay for it. Yeah. And that's exactly what they've done. University um, type researchers, scientists, engineers, and so on, they get their salary from the university or from grants. That's an important source as well. But, you know, they don't, the reason they have to get a job at the university is they can't support themselves outside the university. You think there's no other place for them to go. They have to go there. The problem is they come up with do-gooder projects and stuff that affect all of us, and they never really ask us if we were interested in that in the first place. So we, we hear about it later and say, wait a minute, who voted on that, right? So here we go. Here's what the World Economic Forum says about transhumanism. The central premise of transhumanism, then, is that biological evolution will eventually be overtaken by advances in genetic, wearable, and implantable technologies that artificially expedite the evolutionary process. Now, I just want to let, you let that sink in just for a second. Some of you, I realize, probably believe in evolution. Some of you may well believe in creationism. I'm not going to discuss that. Uh, but. The people that are pushing transhumanism today, including the World Economic Forum, have this idea that however we got here, it wasn't by intelligent design, they're very big on evolution, it wasn't by intelligent design, however, because we now have the technology to modify the elements of life, we will take over intelligent design from here on. They honestly believe that and have said that. This is intentional. Evolution may have gotten us here by accident. Or if you're a creationist, you might say, well, you know, whatever God created in the beginning, and here we are thousands of years later, they're saying, they come into the picture saying, whatever it was, we now are in control. We're going to hijack the evolutionary process and take over from here on. And it's not just for messenger RNA shots that are going into your arms. It's about every living thing on Earth, everything on Earth. We'll see this in a minute. This is a big topic of my book, by the way, um, The Evil Twins of Technocracy and Transhumanism. So I'm going to take you through some pictures. This is where a thousand words starts to add up, right? I'm, I just want you to look at these. We're going to start out now 
go back to Rio de Janeiro in 1992. Rio de Janeiro. Anybody recognize that time, that date? This is where Agenda 21 was created. This was the, the uh, place where the first Earth Summit took place. It was also called the um, UNSAID Conference, that's UNCED, United Nations Conference on Economic Development. It was also sponsored in part by UNEP, that's the uh, United Nations Environmental Program. And this was a kicked off modern sustainable development. This is where it started. And uh, there were two books, uh, or actually basically one book started all with Our Common Future, it was written a few, a few years before that. But uh, the history, the history of building up to 1992 was very much a by byproduct of scholarship that came from the Trilateral Commission from the 1970s. I'm not going to explain that to you, uh, what it was. I'm just telling you. You can read about it in my books. You can go back and read Technocracy Rising. I discuss it extensively. Nevertheless, it came to pass. And every, every effort was brought into, not to mention thousands and thousands of people from all around the planet, to confirm and sign on to the treaty that's, uh, that established sustainable development, which you already heard of in sustainable development goals, Agenda 2030, and so on. But there were some other interesting things that happened in that time uh, back in 1992, things that I missed along the way, I have to confess, but I learned about later. And I'll tell you, the COVID really blew it wide open, uh, which I'm, that, I'm not saying that's a good thing that it happened, but sometimes there are good things that come out of disasters, right? One is our understanding of transhumanism, because if COVID hadn't happened, I don't think hardly anybody would have really gotten onto this. And now we're to the point um, even where, he might say this tonight, uh, Steve Bannon said that uh, transhumanism is going to be the major topic in the 2024 election cycle. Just wait, you'll see, I think he's right. This is coming. So I wanna take you back to 1994. There were two people that attended the uh, 1992 convention. They were the original Greens, which I distinguish from modern Greens because um, even though they were somewhat radical back in those days, they had a little bit more sense about them, uh, a little bit more practical sense than the radical Greens of today. Two of those people attended as principals. Um, they wrote a book two years later, and they digressed. They, uh, they said, you know what, we went, we participated, we even voted, and uh, we heard, went to all the parties, and we heard everything that happened, and we disagree with Rio, the Rio conference altogether. They came away, and, and you might imagine this stuff was censored like crazy, right? No narrative came out of, uh, kind of out of Rio that was allowed to continue. Uh, so their book was pretty well censored back then, but I got a copy of it and I read it and they were absolutely legitimate. Uh, but anyway, The Earth Brokers was their book. It was written by uh, Chatterjee and, and Finger. And I'm gonna read you a couple of things that they wrote in their book. And I have verified this since, I've done a lot of additional original research to verify this in United Nations documents themselves. Unfortunately, I have all those. And by the way, I live in a city where, in Tempe, where we have University of, or excuse me, uh, Arizona State University, realize. It's the most, most sustainable university in the world, they say. And I happened to go down there one day and I found out that they had the entire United Nations catalog of documents in their microfish. Anybody remember microfish? Yes. <laughs> Who uses microfish, right? Oh my gosh. Well, this is what, <laughs> this is what, um, this is what they wrote. Uh, starting out, just to give you an idea about UNSAID, uh, the conference in general. We argue that UNSAID, that's the real conference, uh, Agenda 21, has boosted precisely the type of industrial development that is destructive for the environment, the planet, and its inhabitants. We see how, as a result of UNSAID, the rich will get richer, the poor poorer, while more and more of the planet is destroyed in the process. Can anybody say amen? amen. That's exactly what's happened. They saw it. And they saw it for the right reasons back then, I have to say. But um, that was just to give you an idea of critical analysis that they were thinking here, you know, and they, it goes on though. They, because at the same time in the Rio conference, there was other things going on at the same time in the same place. Like you have a conference with different tracks. That's pretty common today in the commercial world. Whether it may be a, big, a, a technology conference. They'll have maybe one programming language over here for a track, another programming language over here for a track, and you can go to the conference and hear the keynote speakers and then go off to your own track that you want to follow. 
Well, the Biodiversity Convention was one of those things that was going on at the same time. In fact, um, uh, there, I think they said, and some other people have said too, that the Biodiversity Convention was really the main thing that came out of that Rio de Janeiro conference. It was the most substantial thing that came out of it. This is what they write. This is shocking. The convention implicitly equates the diversity of life, animals and plants, to the diversity of genetic codes. By doing so, I'm reading this real slowly, I want you to get it. Diversity becomes something modern science can manipulate. It promotes biotechnology as being essential for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. I believe most of you have a concept of the word biodiversity in your mind that has nothing to do with this species in the forest, the condition of the rainforest in the Amazon jungle, for maybe. But the idea of biodiversity as manipulation of genetic codes is foreign to almost all the population. And yet, this is exactly what they said. Now, they went on to say the main stake raised by the Biodiversity Convention is the issue of ownership and control over biological diversity. The major concern was protecting the pharmaceutical and emerging biotechnology industries. Can you fathom what he is saying here? Now, these are not people that would fit in with this crowd, probably, if they were here today. They were on that left green side. They're not conservative in any way, shape, or form. They were there at Rio to figure out how to solve the development problems between North and South, because the South had been raped by industrialization from the North for decades, and they were sick and tired of it. They thought Rio was going to solve that problem of development for them. They went there and they said, hey, no way. They're just, they're, they're telling us, in fact, we heard this before, they're telling us that, um, that the problem is development. So what do you need? More development. We'll fix, it, we'll fix it with more development. It sounds just kind of like what a technocrat says. You know, you got, did, oh, did our technology cause a problem? No problem. We have more technology to fix that. <laughs> oh, you took a shot. Uh, maybe for, uh, you know, for some virus or something that was supposed to protect you, and oh, gee, it didn't protect you. Oh, we're sorry, but, we, but now the problem, we have another shot for that. See, we'll fix it with more technology. This uh, betting on the cum philosophy in general through this whole thing is pretty striking to me, that there's always a, some other solution. You got a sol problem with development, well, more development will, will fix it. And that's basically what they, what they came away from this. But the idea that they picked up on, I doubt they had any idea at the time what they had discovered, what they had concluded. Today, it hits you like a ton of bricks. The main stake? Yes. This was not some by their own admission, this was not some splinter issue. There were plenty of them. He said, this is the main stake, and I'll tell you why, because they were buzzing with people from the industry. In every meeting that took place, they were swarming these committees, getting their agenda into it. The United Nations picked up biodiversity as promoting the genetic takeover of the planet. That may sound shocking, but listen. The chief medical officer of Moderna, he's now retired from there, Tal Zaks, he said, and this is on the website at 1.2, got scrubbed, you might imagine, we are actually hacking the software of life. This is Moderna, by the way, that produced the shots, you know, messenger RNA shots that go into your arm and uh, gonna make you all better. 
They said it's going to keep you from COVID, and even if it doesn't, it will make you so you don't get so sick if you do get it. And then we find out after the whole thing is done and gone, it not only makes you sick, it gets you sicker, and you still get COVID. But they have another booster for it, you understand. Okay, we're actually hacking the software of life. We think of it as an operating system. Chief medical officer is developing this stuff. So if you could actually change that, if you could introduce a line of code, think back to NBIC, or change a line of code, it turns out it has profound implications for everything. It kind of sets your hair on fire, doesn't it? This, this is the guy that, and who worked for the company that said, oh, it's perfectly safe. No problem. Human trials? No, we don't need human trials. <laughs> you know, human trials. We're, we're so smart. We're so good. We know it works. So just let everybody take it. You know, we'll, we'll figure out what. It kind of reminds you what Nancy Pelosi did once upon a time when she was passing the, uh, the, AF, the Affordable Care Act, right? You'll just have to read the bill before you, you know, vote on it before you get to read the bill. So, you, you know, they, they wouldn't let anybody read the bill before they passed it. You'll just have to pass it to get, to get it. That's kind of what you're thinking here. Profound implications. So what's been GMO'd since 1992? How about seeds? Crops? Anybody here like to shop for GMO-free food in the store, where there's sprouts or where, I don't know, wherever you shop for food? Insects. Oxitec's been releasing GMO mosquitoes in multiple places, including Florida that have a kill switch in them so that the next generation can't survive. Animals have been GMO'd um, ad infinitum, pigs, chickens, turkeys. Um, oh, I've got chickens twice, but uh, hmm, chicken, little chickens and big chickens. <laughs> pigs now, uh, this is interesting, some pictures came out of China of double meat pigs. You should see these pigs. Oh my gosh, like, you know, like the son of Frankenstein or something. Uh, fish, a uh, big deal on fish, you know, salmon, trout, catfish, tilapia, striped bass, flounder, all these types of fish have been GMO'd to grow faster and quicker and maybe with some new things in them that we've never ate before, who knows. Bacteria, viruses have been GMO'd cr like crazy. And lastly, humans. The human domain, uh, of course, we, we're more familiar with now because of COVID. Messenger RNA, if you don't understand, there's plenty of articles out there to go figure out what it is. RNA, you can figure that out too, and most importantly, DNA. That's the, the ultimate state of this, the static state of your genetic code in your body. Uh, messenger RNA, by the way, they told us, of course, it would never, ever, ever, ever get into your DNA. <laughs> never. Right? No worries. Doesn't happen. Then a group of scientists started doing some studies and they found out, well, son of a gun, it goes straight to your, when you get the shot, it goes straight to your liver, takes about six hours, and they discovered that it will actually, uh, in some cases, will cause or will go through a process called reverse transcription and go straight into your DNA. This last year I spent way too much time probably with my new friend, uh, Dr. Judy Mikovits. And, uh, and I said, okay, Judy, tell me again. One more time, would you tell me, am I clear about this? Anyway, um, I, got a, I got an education that was pretty unique, I have to say. But um, humans are on, on the chopping block now. Everything else was, that was available to edit has already been edited. And so humans were simply just the last frontier, like a Star Trek message, you know, the last frontier. So now I'm going to give you some pictures, and I want you to think about these pictures. I'm, I'll just kind of go through them here, and you can look at them. Everybody can see them. 1971? Did you miss this one? 1971? The new genetics, man into Superman. Hmm, special section. Dang. How about 1977? Did you miss this one? The DNA Fuhrer, tinkering with life. Oh, look up there, a day with Jimmy Carter. <laughs> why, why didn't they give him the shot? <laughs> 1980, 
1984, Shaping Life in the Lab, the boom in genetic engineering. I think I knew that guy. No. <laughs> How about 1994? Genetics, the future is now. New breakthroughs can cure disease and save lives, and how much should nature be engineered, you see? And that was the same year that uh, The Earth Brokers was written, right? They weren't wrong. This pretty much validates what they were saying. How about 1999? Gotta love this one, it's got a snake in it. Sheesh. The future of medicine, but listen to the subtitle, if you can see it. How genetic engineering will change us in the next century. How about 2015? The gene machine, what the CRISPR experiments mean for humanity. The reason I'm showing you these, right, is because where were we anyway? Of course, it's Time Magazine. Who buys Time anymore? <laughs> but, well, the reason I use Time Magazine is because it was the, one of the original uh, magazines, media companies that was allowed to attend the Trilateral Commission meetings back in the 70s. Time was uh, one of the, there were about five or six different companies back then. That they could go in and listen to the meetings, but they couldn't report on it. So Time has been that kind of magazine. Here's one I pulled out of Scientific American. Progress and Controversy, Genetic Engineering. And the reason I did, I looked down at this in the, 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 the section one there, down in the middle, 1.2, the RNA revolution. Boy, that should have been a forewarning right there. And of course, 1.32, an on-off switch for genes. I don't want anybody to know what my on-off switches are. I don't know about you. Okay, here's your favorite uh, person to hate. This is, I know, that you can't make this up. A postmodern condition is the end of humanity's reliance on our congenital bodies by transforming our frail version 1.2 human bodies into their far more durable and capable version 2.0 counterparts. Are you ready? Are you ready to take them up on your far more durable and capable version of your new body 2.0? I know some of you might have had a, maybe a little reconstruction or some facial lifts or something. I don't know, you know, to kind of get things done, you know. But 2.0 body, you, you know, changing my genes, in other words, I don't think so. Nevertheless, there's a table right out the door. You can sign up. Uh, Karen, you, you took care of that, right? <laughs> the 2.0 line will start right there. You just can't make this stuff up. When I say these people are off the rails, you cannot imagine how far off the rails you are until you see stuff like this. I'm reminding of, kind of remind, I'm not going to go into any diverge on anything, but I listened to some, uh, some audio um, tapes of old time uh, pastors and preachers, theologians, <laughs> There's one phrase that is stuck in my mind, and I periodically, when I look at stuff like this, it comes back to me. And that phrase is, describes what these, I believe these people are, not just by looking at Klaus, I mean, he's a scary looking guy. But when you talk about transforming people's bodies, through genetic engineering into something that they never voted for, never asked for, and never wanted, you have to conclude, this is where I conclude, these are monsters of iniquity. Period. Monsters of iniquity. They are promoting a narrative throughout the world, and we've talked about this already in two presentations. The narrative, of course, is um, coming from people like Klaus Schwab, not exclusively, but I will say whoever controls the narrative controls everything else. And here's how I explain the Great Reset. We're not talking about technocracy today, you can get my books on that. 
Technocracy is to societal structure and operation. It's the transformation of the global economic system. Transhuman, as transhuman, tr transhumanism is to the humans who live there. Does that make sense? You've got a one-two punch here. You're creating this brand new utopia, but do you put old version 1.0 people into this new utopia? Well, that would be dumb, wouldn't it? It's like, to, their, to them, of course it would be dumb. You don't put new wine into old wineskins. You put new wine into new wineskins, and so it will stretch and conform, and that's exactly their thinking on this. They're not thinking biblical, by the way, but that's for a biblical concept. These people are transforming the whole world, and when Klaus Schwab says the Great Reset, do not think he's just talking about one singular thing. There are two parts to the Great Reset that is very clear on their website. Technocracy is to societal structure and operation as transhumanism is to the humans who live there. That's why the bums rushes on, to change, get control of, and to change human DNA into their image and their imagination. How frightening is that? You know, I just maybe, maybe want to conclude with this. While you think about some of the people that are players in this, I'm not going to tell you who these are. You can, this is a mystery to you. You can figure it out. You know some of them. But I do want to say one thing to you, because I realize <clears throat> some of you in this room have um, relatives, maybe grandparents, maybe parents that were greatly affected by the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. And um, I just listened to a video by Vera Shrav, amazing. I want to tell you that this whole thing is nothing more than warmed over eugenics from a previous century. Don't ever think it's anything really new. They've just relabeled it, they've extended it, and it is just as alive and well today. And I showed a slide in some of my other presentations on how many times after World War II, the world said, never again would we allow this to happen. Never again. What happened? We're right back where we started. Nobody saw it coming. And now I agree with my, with my former colleagues here, and now is the time to stand up again and say never again. Not only stop it, but never again. And of course, there's more people in this that are involved in it, but these are some of the key people, key players that are controlling the narrative right now. Some in our country and some on a global stage. I want to close with this, I think. My book, The Evil Twins of Technocracy and Transhumanism, is by far going to be my, probably my final word on this. Um, it's not covering anything really that I've said in the past, but um, we need to see this whole thing that's going on in the world now in a new light. Uh, if you've got a mind to take a, a, an early peek at it, it'll be out, in, I think, by Thanksgiving or by, uh, yeah, by Thanksgiving, certainly by Christmas. Uh, you can go to patrickwood.substract.com and you can subscribe there. I kind of want to leave you with this. Andrew Breitbart, I didn't bring the quote up, but he said something like this. I'll say it again. I'll paraphrase. A good fireman runs toward the fire. A good policeman runs toward the, the gunfight. Right? A good soldier runs towards the battle. That's how we won World War II. We're challenged now in a war that's been declared on humanity. If we do not respond, we will certainly die. Now, we'll certainly die anyway, eventually. But we will die young if we don't stand up and run towards the fire, towards the battle. This is just simply where we are, and I'm sorry to say it, but nobody wants to do I mean, well, we don't want to do that because life is good in America. We need to keep it that way. That's what our ancestors said that ran into the, war, the battle in World War I and World War II and the Korean War and other places around. We need to do it again, and the time is now. Thanks.